Greetings, this is Paul, your Pacific Northwest Trail Guide. I want to help you pick your next trail to explore, so let's check this one out. The Strawberry Mountain Wilderness is a rugged and beautiful place to visit. It's a bit of an oasis way out in the high desert of eastern Oregon. It's a remarkable place where even in the late summer there are so many active springs that you'll rarely go more than a couple miles on the trail without passing a spring, creek, or lake. This loop plan takes you about 19 miles with 4,900 feet of climbing over three days. You'll spend all of your time up in high mountains, starting at almost 6,000 feet elevation and peaking a little over 9,000 feet. The trip is broken up into three days of hiking. The first day is the shortest, only four miles. The second day is the longest. You'll be going about seven miles carrying all your gear that day, and optionally an extra two miles without your gear to visit the peak of Strawberry Mountain. On the last day, you'll travel about six miles. You'll find accessible water sources multiple times along the trail each day hiking and at both campsite locations. The water sources are lakes and springs that you may want to treat before drinking. You'll head south on Bridge Street from Prairie City, Oregon to make your way to the trailhead for this trip. A couple miles out of town it becomes gravel and turns into Strawberry Road. That gravel road is very nice, but a few more miles before the trailhead you cross this little bridge near a spring and the road gets a lot rougher and kind of steep, with some pretty big ruts you wouldn't want to take a low clearance vehicle over. You pass many campgrounds on this stretch and eventually the road dead ends at Strawberry Basin Trailhead. Your destination for the first day is Little Strawberry Lake. To start your trip, head up from the Little Trailhead parking area past the campground on your left and restroom on your right to the Strawberry Basin Trailhead. This trail climbs up for a couple of miles until you reach Strawberry Lake. During this first day, you pretty much climb the 1300 feet of elevation gain gradually the whole three and a half miles to your first camp location. When you are pretty close to the lake, you'll see the Slide Basin Trail off to the left. This is where you'll be returning from on the last day. Continue on straight and you'll approach Strawberry Lake. The trail splits off to the left and right, encircling the lake. You can go to the left here to take the most direct route to Little Strawberry Lake. The trail soon splits again, and you'll stay to the left to stay up on the ridge and take the direct route, or you can take the lakeside trail for a more exploration and climbing if you feel like it. Eventually, you leave Strawberry Lake and continue climbing up through the forest. Before long, you approach the bottom of Strawberry Falls. As you approach the moist, mossy area of the falls, you almost feel like you're in some other place than this dry, high desert. Continuing past the falls, the trail switches back a couple times sharply 
to climb to the top of the falls. You cross a small bridge that takes you over the spring water before it gushes over the falls. Right after the little bridge, you approach the junction with the little strawberry trail. Turn left here to head up to your first camp up at Little Strawberry Lake. There is a small campsite near this junction above the trail, but ascend just a bit more and you'll soon be cruising up to the Little Strawberry Lake and the awesome amphitheater of cliffs surrounding it. You'll find a couple of well-defined camping areas here before you come right up to the lake. If you approach the lake and cross the little stream that comes from it, you can find several more camping areas around that side. These are like the five-star hotel version of backcountry camp spots. Find a great spot and settle in and enjoy this magnificent setting. You may encounter mountain goats in this area. They may even wander into the camping areas. But try to keep your distance and avoid leaving anything out for them to get into if you leave your camp for a while. This young Rocky Mountain goat and one of its parents paid my camp a morning visit, probably hoping to find something salty. Rocky Mountain goats were overhunted to the point where they could no longer be found in Oregon in the 1800s. Thanks to the reintroduction efforts of Native American tribes and the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, their populations are returning. This is it, the big day. 
the second day of this trip is the toughest. You do the most climbing, deal with the most exposure, and descend quite a bit too. But at least you don't have to do any driving. And there's some cool sights to see along the way as well. You'll be visiting the top of Strawberry Mountain, exploring new ridges, rounding Indian Spring Butte, and coming to High Lake. You'll head back down the Little Strawberry Trail on the second day to join back up to the Strawberry Basin Trail where you left it before and continue up towards Strawberry Mountain. Follow the Strawberry Basin Trail up through various terrain, climbing up all the way and getting closer and closer to Strawberry Mountain, which looms up in front of you as Strawberry Lake drops away below down the hill to your right. As the trail turns west, it also flattens out a little bit as you go by a grassy little valley where Onion Creek begins. There are a couple of campsites in this area, and eventually you'll pass by this former log hut and approach a steep climb up to a saddle between Indian Spring Butte and Strawberry Mountain. After you get up to the saddle, the trail cuts back towards Strawberry Mountain and you approach a junction in the trail. You can stash most of your gear near this junction to have a lighter load for the one mile trip up to the top of Strawberry Mountain. When you're ready, take the path to the right from the junction to head up. The left path is where you'll go when you return from the summit. The trail climbs steadily at first, bringing you along the east side of Strawberry Mountain. You may enjoy swarms of California tortoiseshell butterflies at the right time of year and depending on the brood year. All these guys are blowing by constantly and it's hard to know if they're just being thrown around by the wind or actually flying somewhere. Soon you reach a junction up around the northeast side of the mountain. You turn left here to continue up to the top. The route soon gets rocky and steeper. Continue up to the top, following the switchbacks and strategically placed rocks. Just below the summit, you'll see this little wind shelter containing a summit log. Enjoy the views at the top if you're lucky enough to have clear skies, and head on back the way you came to your gear when you're ready.
Once you've collected your gear, you'll be heading out the other way from the junction there. Follow the trail along a ridge with expansive views to the west. Much of this trail is pitched as it follows the steep ridge and can be hard on the ankles. After traversing the side of the canyon, you emerge into this wide, clear area where the trail splits. The Pine Creek Trail heads straight over the hill and down, but we will turn left here onto the Road's End Trail, which is actually more of a former road. Follow this wide, rocky road. Wait, don't think about ice cream. Uh, over this fairly flat section until you reach a trailhead and gravel road. The trailhead is at a big U-bend in the road, and you'll take the bend off to the left going uphill. Follow the road uphill for just a short way, and at the top of the hill, you will find a trailhead for the Skyline Trail. It starts on a ledge overlooking a wide valley of partially burned forest, which contains High Lake where you'll be making camp. Start down the trail for a long descent down to the lake. The trail makes its way there at a gentle slope, switching back many times. You'll notice things getting less dry and pass by a couple springs as you get close to the lake. As you approach it, a spur trail goes off to the left, which can take you to a camping area on that side of the lake. Or if you continue straight, you cross a small outflow from the lake and up to a small junction, which has some more campsites nearby. High Lake may not be as dramatic a setting as the previous camp, but it is a peaceful place with a much more accessible lakeshore for you to explore. Sadly, I did not have a fishing pole with me on this trip, but as you can see, there is at least one fish hanging out in here. Getting started on your final day, you find the junction near the outflow from the lake. The trail splits into a Y there, where you stay to the left to continue on the Skyline Trail. On this last day of your trip, you'll be going six and a half miles with a bit of climb starting out and then doing a bunch of descent the rest of the way out. You'll make a short steep climb up to the saddle high above the east side of High Lake. Huge rock cairns line the trail on this section and the rock formation named Rabbit Ears looms far off to your left. When you finally emerge at the top, you're greeted with a grand view and can see Mud Lake off in the distance. Continue down the trail as it starts a gradual descent, and you'll soon come to a junction with the Mud Lake Trail. You take the left to stay on the Skyline Trail, continuing your return trip.
After that turn, you'll enter this section of thin trail along a scree slope. Make your way along this section, treading lightly. You should see the trail along the slope far ahead and get a clear view of where you're heading. Slide Lake also becomes visible, far below off and to the east. After you traverse that slope, the trail dives down in some switchbacks under the cover of the forest as you descend steeply, then more gradual as you approach Slide Lake. You'll pass by a junction with the Slide Lake Trail and continue on through the forest towards another deeper canyon. You may run into some blue grouse in this area. They can be hard to see if you aren't paying close attention. Before you know it, you're right on top of them and they flush off in a loud flutter. Soon after you emerge from the forest onto this ridge, the trail splits. The left going uphill and the right going down. You can take either path depending on your situation. The left path is most direct but follows a very narrow pitched trail on a steep slope that can be sketchy to navigate in some areas. In severe weather, it could be dangerous or impassable. The right path will add more climbing to your trip as it will take you down into the canyon and back up to join back again, but avoids the narrow, more tricky trail. The longer path going down only adds another 150 foot elevation climb and less than a quarter mile. Choose your route based on your situation. Either way you go, you'll emerge at this junction just before rounding the hillside, now traveling on the Slide Basin Trail. Horse user trail, foot travel trail. Interesting. All right. Continue on as the trail descends down the well-covered slope towards the close of this loop. You arrive at the junction with Strawberry Basin Trail after a short descent. The junction is a bit of a mess with trails going in a few directions and the signs facing the opposite way from your travel, but you'll hang a hard right here to take the most direct path to the main exit. Now traveling on familiar ground, you continue a gradual descent back to the trailhead on the Strawberry Basin Trail. I highly recommend doing this trip in late summer or early fall. Timing this right can have a big impact on your experience. Visiting in the middle of September, it wasn't too hot, I never saw a single mosquito, and some vibrant colors were starting to show. Okay, let's go over the ratings for this trail. The terrain on this trail is pretty varied, but in consideration of the long stretches of narrow pitched trail and loose sketchy areas of scree to navigate, 
it gets three rocks out of five for terrain. For elements, the high elevation of this hike means you probably want to watch snow levels and be careful about when you choose to do it. You'll most likely experience strong wind gusts on a few high areas of the route as well. Also, consider the exposure on this hike. The first day is mostly covered, but over half the time you will be traveling on completely exposed hillsides. I rate this three clouds out of five for elements. Though the second day is kind of long with the summit, this is still only about seven miles per day on average. This hike gets three boots for distance. This trip, including the summit on the second day, pushes this one up to four mountains out of five for climb. You'll be doing a lot of climbing on this one. Well, that wraps it up for this edition of Pacific Northwest Trail Guide. I hope I have or will soon help you pick your next trail to explore. I scouted this trail in September of 2021, but trails are always evolving. If you pick this trail and encounter any changes people might like to know about, please help out your fellow explorers by sharing in the comments on this video. I've shown some of the beautiful sights of this trail in what feeble capacity video can render. A picture may be worth a thousand words, but an experience with all of your senses cannot even be conveyed in pictures or video. So don't take my word for it. Get out there and see it for yourself.